Hi, everyone. Um, my name is Mirna Ayub. I'm a lecturer here at USC School of Architecture um, and a proud alumni. Uh, welcome to the 2021 USC School of Architecture Generation Next. Um, I am this year's co-host with Alvin Huang and Aaron Cuevas. Uh, this year marks the fifth year for this annual event. Um, that really just aims to celebrate the ind independent work of our young alumni. Uh, envisioned kind of as a platform to share unique journeys, words of wisdom, and a diverse body of work, we are delighted to continue this tradition, especially after this past year where we're all sheltering in place across the globe. Um, it's wonderful to all gather together as a community, even though we cannot be there in person. Uh, we have a group of talented designers on this year's roster, working in a range of disciplines uh, from architecture, product design, community building, placemaking, graphic design, fabrication, design research, and much more. I'd like to introduce our speakers today. Uh, Chet Callahan, a uh, Bachelor of Architecture, 2003. Uh, Ali Chen, Bachelor of Architecture, 2012. Uh, Simone Kessler, Bachelor of Architecture, 2013. Uh, Regina Tang, a Bachelor of Science in Architectural Studies, 2013. Uh, Eric Omar Camarena, a Master of Architecture, 2014. Uh, Lean Katrib, a Bachelor of Architecture 2014. Uh, Juan Yao and Scarlett Song, a Bachelor of Architecture 2015. Uh, Camille Elston, a Master of Heritage Conservation uh, 2018. Uh, Joshua Foster, a Master of Architecture 2019. Um, and Toby Ashiru and Mor Morgan. Summer Master of Architecture 2019 and 2018. Um, the presenters are going to share their stories and their work. So please feel free to engage in discussions and ask questions through the Zoom platform. Uh, but the, at the end of the presentation, uh, we'll be uh, please join us for a virtual reception and kind of a networking opportunity. Uh, we'll be there via Sophia. Uh, to meet you all and have some discussions. Uh, we'll provide the link again at the end of the presentations, but I'm going to pass it on to our presenters. It's all you, Chet. Okay, great. Yeah, <laughs> sorry. <laughs> I know this is my cue, but um, uh, I'm frantically trying to get my notes up. Okay, here we go. <laughs> well, thank you, um, Myrna, Alvin, and Aaron um, for including me in Generation Next 2021. Um, just so you all know, I'm joining you from spring break in Zion National Park. So you might see some faces invading my uh, Zoom space here. So just ignore them. <laughs> um, Anyway, I, um, I wanted to start with the, a slide of my son, actually, um, that just popped up there. Um, my notes are generally chronologically with the slide, chronologically synced to the slides, so I'll do my best to keep up, but um, I, I, we'll see what happens. <laughs> so anyway, uh, when I was a student at USC, I attended a lecture by alumnus Mark Rios. And at, um, at that talk in Harris Hall, um, he gave each of us playing cards that his office had designed. Um, and it, it really made me think, what does graphic design have to do with architecture? And that question began my evolution toward holistic design at a time when architecture was considered a pure elevated pursuit and everything else had been relegated to lesser professionals. Um, so I went on to work on these very, you know, architecture forward design oriented offices throughout LA for the next five years, but the idea of a more expansive practice was kind of furtively gestating. Um, and uh, meanwhile, I completed my first solo project, um, 
also uh, my husband and my first home together, which was the last slide that I missed there. <laughs> but um, and um, in, in 2008, my husband and I welcomed our first son into our family and I left the full time workforce, um, learning to live with um, additional people in the house and raising my son made me think differently about relationships and the type of office environment that I wanted to return to. So I set out to create an intentional work environment um, and foster a new collaborative relationship with my clients. Uh, the work is not wholly about our aesthetic, but about the client, our relationship to the client and our client's needs. Um, and that's what makes the work exciting to me, um, that every project that comes into the office asks something new of our team because it's coming from a new person. Um, and while our work output can look quite different from one project to the next, uh, we've identified seven pillars that define our work and the values of our office. Um, and while these pillars are not specific to any one project we have in the office, um, we paired each uh, pillar with a project. And so that's what you're kind of seeing playing in the background here. Um, the first project that, that happened, you know, my husband and my first house, um, is really the start of like a, an endeavor to craft um, and which has evolved to be this collaboration with artisans and makers and stonemasons and muralists. Um, and, and that each of those relationships bring something exciting to the project. Um, the second pillar that I wanna discuss is, is office, um, which were those images of the office that, that went by already. <laughs> um, and you know, I, I founded the office with a fundamental belief that two or three minds are better than one and, and wanting to establish a very horizontal uh, management structure. And at Chet Callahan Architecture, uh, we foster a unique office culture characterized by generosity, curiosity, and creativity. We nurture an intimate, talented team of engaged designers who come with a diversity of skill sets, experiences, backgrounds, and perspectives. And what you, what's on the screen now is our Satsuma project. Um, and this is really an idea or really meant to demonstrate community. Um, the clients for this project are two artist brothers who wanted to create a community space that was both festive, but also expose people to their work. Uh, they wanted it to serve a commercial function, but also feel like a party, um, a place where they want to be every day to create work, sell work and hang out. Uh, so more generally, we design unique interventions that both enhance the existing neighborhood and create new moments within the collective experience and gather uh, to gather and connect. Um, we, um, Oh, I think I, I moved these slides around. <laughs> so this project that's up right now is, um, is Herbert. Um, and this is really an uh, example of how we place clients at the center of our design process. Um, this, is, this project is really for six, we had six clients on this project. Um, it's a husband and wife, they're two kids and one set of in-laws. Uh, their original plan was to buy properties close to each other, but budgetary constraints put that out of reach. Um, this is in the Culver City neighborhood, and they just really couldn't afford uh, that situation. So instead, we renovated an existing house and built two additions to create um, a communal living zone for all six uh, and their guests and extended family, a separate apartment for the in-laws, and a third more intimate family work hangout zone for the youngest two generations. Um, this project that's showing now is our Flynn project. Um, the, these clients came to us with a neutral 1990s late modernist home high in the Hollywood Hills and wanted to infuse it with their own personality and, and personal art collection. Um, so in addition to kind of updating a lot of finishes, we also um, created these custom furniture pieces that really um, brought the whole project together. Um, and and uh, putting together certain 90s references like the Memphis um, uh, uh, and, and also uh, late 90s graphics and uh, infusing that with some Art Deco details and kind of bringing it all together. Um, this last project that we're showing is a project called Cummings um, and is meant to uh, demonstrate uh, our pillar of ecology. And so despite like a suboptimal siting of the house, a layout designed for service and the lack of a garage and a series of lamentable 1970s renovations, the stature of this 1895 home alone justified its preservation. And it was also in keeping with the client's focus on minimizing waste. Um, uh, I'm gonna skip through some of this. Um, so, um, 
inspired by the home's original windmill and solar water system, um, we installed photovoltaic power and gray water to irrigate the estate's gardens. We also removed floors and aligned circulation to create a four-story volume to serve as a heat chimney and light well, which passively cools and lights the north-facing interiors. So I did my best. <laughs> On to you, Allie. Hi, everybody. Uh, I'm going to keep my camera off because my internet's terrible. But um, um, I'm Ali Chen. I graduated from BRC in 2012. And since then, I've taken kind of a nonlinear journey towards packaging and branding. Um, since graduating, I've worked as a visualization artist at, um, at Laptop Rendering and as a designer at BRC Ingalls Group. And it was during this time that I started wanting to do something on my own. So I started entering competitions and I entered um, a competition held by our connect called Dry Futures that called for solutions to the drought. So my idea was to create demand for more drought friendly forms of agriculture. So using the cactus, um, the cactus because it not only saves water and its growth, but it, um, actually has the ability to purify water. So my concept was a hybrid cactus farm, wastewater management plant, and eco resort. And its aim would be to increase demand and awareness for this plant and raise funds for research. So my, my project is called Grassroots Cactivism, um, and it placed first in the speculative category um, so since then, um, I've had a lot of environmentalists reach out to me about my plans for the continuation of this project. Um, and I really didn't know what to tell them at first. Um, I knew this was a project I really wanted to continue, but I didn't know how um, within my means. So I thought maybe an informational campaign would be the best way to go. So kind of um, like marketing cactus um, in the same way that kale was marketed by a PR firm 10 years ago to its status today. Um, I thought maybe that we could do the same for cactus. Um, it would maybe look like um, collaborations with local chefs. Um, but what I ended up at was a product. So um, Earth, Wind and Cactus is a brand that I began um, in the past year uh, in collaboration with an agricultural collective and a partner in the Middle East. And it takes the waste produced by their cactus jam production um, to create this uh, extremely potent uh, facial oil. Um, and its aim is kind of just to highlight the sustainable benefits um, and the skin benefits of this plant um, with the means I have available to me. Um, and in creating this product, um, it got me interested in branding. Um, and so I decided to pursue a master's in packaging design at Pratt Institute. Um, I thought it was the best way for me to um, combine my interest in branding in a three-dimensional way. Um, what I really didn't expect was um, how similar packaging is to architecture. Like, uh, like a lot of the graphic standards are similar or almost identical. And a lot of the things that both have to consider like um, structures, uh, ventilation, especially in regards to food packaging, um, life cycle uh, modularity um, in regards to merchandising, they're all so similar, but just at a smaller scale. Um, so during my time here, I, we were asked to reimagine existing products on the market. So for example, Mr. Potato Head could be this gender non-binary potato toy um, or spam, for example, could be, um, spam is like a very all American product, but different cultures have taken it um, and adapted it to their own cuisine. So how can we build on that? Um, aspect of spam and market it as this uh, all-American product with international appeal. Um, what that would look like in retail, um, in direct to consumer, um, highlighting these different recipes from around the world that people use spam in, um, maybe like a subscription service for spam in collaboration with other brands um, to bring this product to uh, the contemporary age. Um, similarly, with Furby, 
which is currently marketed just towards children. Um, what her, the Furby is essentially like a hackable product. So how can we build on that? Maybe market Furby towards the elderly um, who are in need of companionship or towards millennials who are in need of convenience um, and building on this idea of Furby as essentially like a hackable Alexa um, to be able to customize it to everyone's needs um, and what that would look like in with a new brand ecosystem. So during this time, I was also pursuing my architecture licensure. So I produced um, a digital product um, in collaboration with Pratt's Game Lab. Um, this is uh, it's called ARE Inquisition. And it will actually uh, be launching next week on the App Store, um, only available on iOS right now. But its aim is to make um, the licensure pro process more fun. Um, so this was kind of born out of my own study process. And I just wanted to make this process a little less painful for those around me. Um, so I, uh, since Pratt, I've started my own creative practice. I'm working on a wide range of projects. Some currently are uh, sustainable packaging for a knitwear brand, um, branded architecture for a zero waste concept store. Um, and as well as uh, brand identity for other designers and architects um, and their services and um, a lot of sustainability consulting work um, in an age where uh, sustainability kind of makes people just lose focus. So um, over, oops, sorry. overall, um, I think, uh, I'm kind of just more interested in learning how different industries inform each other. And I hope my kind of fluid path inspires people to do the same. Thank you. Cool. Um, hi, I'm Simone Kessler, Ali. That was amazing and definitely inspiring. Um, I found a design lab called Made to Matter five years ago because I wanted to work at a company that helped solve social problems with more than just architects, so a little more interdisciplinary. Um, and our team of interdisciplinary folks allows us to kind of look at solutions to problems in um, different ways. And we're not really tied to an architectural outcome a lot of times. Sometimes it's a large commercial space that we create like this one here. Um, other times it's a traditional home. Sometimes it's a foldable yurt and sometimes it's an online platform. It just really depends. So um, a lot of our work focuses on reframing our organic and natural environments in interesting ways. Um, love bringing things like this 100 year old terracotta into a super commercial um, office building or bringing something like rammed earth or plants um, into spaces you wouldn't normally see them. And we really love playing with light in our work. That's really exciting for us. Um, and we're on a constant journey to sort of push the boundaries of how we experience space uh, in a way that makes you feel really present when you're experiencing it and hopefully nourishing, especially in office environments that can be really um, daunting. We really wanna make those places super enjoyable. And so, um, yeah, we want people to really feel connected in our spaces. And so this project here is, um, we call the nest. And so the, the prompt is really how might we create sustainable artist housing on untouched land. And um, we looked at the surrounding environment and we saw a bunch of aspen trees. So um, I went ahead and like studied how those eyes are sort of placed and used that to kind of paint light into the space. And now this um, little nest is an artist gallery. Um, and yeah, just sort of shows what this sort of micro housing typology could be on um, in a place that really doesn't have anything else, no infrastructure. And you can sort of see how, how the space is used and it changes over time. I really love this space. Um, this one is the Villa Olio and the prompt here was how might we sort of bring this farm, this is on an olive farm, how can we bring that into the home and also allow for a multi-generational family to occupy, occupy this space at once 
which we all know is pretty difficult um, having sort of all these different families come together. So creating a home um, on this olive farm was really important bringing in these trees, but also this project is super remote in Montenegro and um, really understanding the construction there and how we can kind of uh, create something simple was really important as well. So using CMU bricks with a stone veneer, kind of nodding at the traditional construction of that area, but still using a more traditional method. Um, and obviously bringing in a lot of light was really important and cutting out spaces for trees seems to be something I do a lot in my work, um, really bringing a lot of nature into the space. So this here is, um, it's called the Nook and the prompt for this project was how can we push the boundaries of housing and be able to bring an insulated home anywhere. So this product, um, we wanted it to fit into a checked bag. And so it's under 50 pounds, under 62 linear inches. And we really tried to explore what home means and what the limits of comfort are. And so comfort to us meant something that was rigid, um, standing room for, you know, someone who's 6'2", um, natural light was super important and also natural ventilation, but also being able to lock a door, which we kind of take for granted or even having um, the inside of the space feel not like a yurt or a tent, but actually be this micro wood veneer that doesn't add much weight. It added like two or three pounds, but really um, adds a lot to the space. And you can see how this sort of folds down. And we worked with a NASA origamist, um, an engineer, on this specific uh, problem, still in development. And this one here is um, kind of exploring the idea of public space, a public forum digitally. And so, uh, yeah, how can we create a digital space that mimics the freedom of organic social environment was really important to us. So movement was super important to us, which feels very architectural and having a non-hierarchical um, spatial sound. So we worked with an 8D audio engineer to create this platform. Um, and so something that was really interesting to us is unlike Zoom, where you kind of have this hierarchical sound, you all have to listen to me no matter what, sorry. Um, you can actually separate and listen to people as you sort of move throughout this space. Um, and so this project here is a more traditional architecture um, office in El Segundo. And the prompt was how might we create an office that grows and changes over time with its employees? Um, so this company was very growth oriented. They're an education startup. And so we used a lot of trees in the space sort of painted with shadows. Um, and we even like had these movable partitions and, um, and this company was actually growing from 200 to 300 people within a year. And so uh, we actually built out 27 different modular conference spaces, which are all based on uh, four different types of collaboration and ideation. So we made some smaller spaces for more like private ideation, um, all the way up to this really big greenhouse with all these hanging plants. And we put this sort of, um, people really requested to look at trees. And so we put this, this garden um, here. We created these origami sound panels put a lot of art in the space. And really what we wanted to do is uh, reflect the values of the company and their physical environment. So the employees were constantly reminded of their mission every day. And that was really important to us. Um, and so you can see on the right, that's one of the, the modular conference spaces that we brought in. We fabricated them in Oakland and brought them here. And um, yeah, and they have whiteboards on either side. and. Um, they can sort of configure them as the company grows. And um, yeah, embrace the challenge. Um, this is the kitchen space and you can just sort of see that there's little reflections in, um, in that company culture and mission. Thank you. Thanks, Simone. Uh Good evening, my name is Regina Ting. Uh, I'm an architectural designer based in Los Angeles. I also teach at UCLA AUD in the graduate and undergraduate programs. And so tonight I'd like to share with you a few projects that look at how architecture mediates our relationship to the environment. Um, I'm specifically interested in uh, the way that buildings foreground temporal or experiential qualities of environment, such as light and air. I think the way that we approach these atmospheric qualities is deeply tied to our construction of nature. 
And so, especially in light of climate change, I think these constructions need to be re-examined. Um, I began to articulate this interest uh, during my graduate studies at Princeton. And then afterwards, this led me to work for Kazuo Sejima and Ryu Nishizawa at SANA in Tokyo. And so during uh, my time there, that professional practice really allowed me to see how uh, concept and practice could really merge together. Um, so I'll begin by sharing a conceptual project uh, I call Cloud Mountain. And uh, this responds to a brief, which is to design a mountain anywhere in the world. And so I think as an architectural object, the mountain offers a kind of critical distance to examine a disciplinary convention. Uh, so I was interested in uh, looking at the mountain as a vehicle to design climate. Uh, I began with a survey of different mountainous regions across the, across the globe, uh, looking for different ways that the shape of the land and the shape of the weather relate to each other. And so I'm thinking of the mountain almost at like a pasta maker, uh, able to create form um, in the clouds. And so these are physical models, uh, which illustrate some of uh, the relationships I found. And one of the interesting things about clouds is actually they require a kind of nucleus to form around. Uh, typically it's something like a dust particle. So for this proposal then, I wanted to cite the mountain in uh, this port city of Rotterdam. And so why, why Rotterdam? Two key things. The first is that the ship traffic uh, in and out of the port produces exhaust. And we actually, this exhaust can be productive as a sort of cloud seeding. Um, the second is that uh, the Netherlands are the lowlands. So they famously have a problem of flooding. And so essentially what I was proposing was that the mountain uh, being offshore would collect clouds and therefore produce rain offshore, therefore mitigating some of the flooding on the mainland. Um, so uh, in order to design the form of the mountain, uh, I was working between digital 3D modeling as we typically do in our field, uh, as well as uh, computational fluid dynamics software. So by toggling between these two softwares, I'm uh, looking to see is this form really uh, effective in creating the, uh, the kind of weather patterns or a fluid movement that I desire. Um, and so one of the other interesting things about this project is that uh, because there are no mountains in the Netherlands, it also has a recreational component. So rather than having to travel to, for example, uh, Belgium or France to ski, then the, this kind of island mountain provides a, a new recreational opportunity uh, local to the area. Um, and so this next project is a proposal for a three uh, unit ho holiday home on the New Jersey coast uh, in a town called Beach Haven West. This was done in collaboration with a good friend of mine, Sonia Flamberg. And so the fundamental sort of issue that this project addresses is how to build in a coastal zone. So we had to elevate the, the house above the flood elevation. And so then the question comes, how do you deal with the sixth surface? And so uh, we propose to essentially think of that sixth surface as part of a 360 degree wraparound porch and layering, uh, creating layers of thermal gradients in the building. And so in that we take that same approach also to the materiality. Here we have an external uh, shell of polycarbonate and then a soft denim insulation layer recycled and then uh, cross laminated timber for the structural layer. And where typically in a building, you would merge all these layers into seven inches of a wall assembly. In this design, what we've done is we've pulled all those uh, layers apart so that it really becomes a uh, part, the wall really separated becomes part of the aesthetic experience of the homes. This relationship between the interior and exterior is also investigated in my research on thermal caustics. So what is a caustic? It's that light pattern that's on the ground uh, adjacent to the model here. And so it forms when light refracts through glass, uh, but it's not just visible light that's refracting through glass, but also heat. And so essentially what I'm proposing is to uh, use uh, a glass facade as a huge lens, um, targeting natural light onto a thermal mass or essentially a heat sink. Um, so to test the strategy, I use Philip Johnson's glass house as a case study. The issue with this, uh, strategy is that while conceptually it's quite simple, the, the problem comes in implementing, uh, the fact is that the sun moves, right? So that complicates things quite a bit. 
And so I worked with an interdisciplinary team uh, to develop a form finding algorithm using evolutionary problem solving. And essentially we create a wavy surface, right? And so uh, the light passing through this wavy surface uh, is sort of focusing and then collapsing throughout the course of a day, uh, of a year. And one of the really interesting things about this project was our ability to uh, test the forms we were making through various methods. So through rendering and also through of physical models. Um, but more than providing a proof of uh, concept for a facade system, I think this project really asks us to reconsider the assumptions that we make uh, about our building. So a typical, uh, typical green building code assumes that uh, in order to produce thermal comfort, it requires a hermetically sealed box, right? And what we're saying is actually by uh, thoughtfully allowing solar heat gain in, we can uh, be opportunistic about uh, the way we interact with the environment. And so we're looking to uh, really uh, question sort of the, our fundamental assumptions about how thermal, uh, thermal structures work in architecture, uh, which I think is a great way to sort of contribute to the ongoing conversation around climate change. Thank you. Hello there. So you can see the year I graduated. I was in LA since LA. I came in from uh, Guadalajara, Mexico. I'm Mexican and uh, I'm gonna show you three projects today. The first of which actually came out of my thesis project from USC. Uh, I developed these thesis uh, working with Marcos Sanchez and a bunch of uh, master students. They had some tags of key interest they had and I was interested in networks that happen in the air, kind of like an air monumentality. And uh, it all begins in the very center of, of Mexico City. Um, Mexico is a very uh, centralized country. So I was studying the uh, stories of decentralization then. and uh, what I'm attempting with this project is to visualize how uh, airborne telecommunication uh, is shown. We developed this device, this kind of, uh, we call it a, a portable uh, star and it has a little computer that turns Wi-Fi signals read by an antenna into a gradient of color in which red means the highest number of uh, emitting antennas legible at any spot. And blue would mean the least amount of uh, radio transmissions in the, in the Wi-Fi uh, bands. Uh, so if you could click on it, Mirna, the, the video will start, please, or something like that. There you go. Most of this project is concerned with the visual narrative of the, of the urban landscape itself. Uh, most of it comes out of this image that I had already photographed before going to LA about the angel of independence crowning the HSBC tower. And uh, here the device is moving into the Bosque de Chapultepec, a forest, which is actually the only instance in which the uh, radio transmission is at its lowest, uh, paradoxically right next to those high rises. And uh, also if you can hit play again, please. Ooh. Uh, and the paseo, which means a, a promenade, a stroll, a walk, ended up in the headquarters for the company that monopolizes most of the um, internet services. Things have changed a little bit since then, but it's basically a story of uh, decentralization. 
after that project that I did in Mexico City, I moved to Puebla, where I, where I currently teach architecture at the University of the Americas. Puebla is basically on the other side of the volcano from, as if you look at it from Mexico City. And uh, this second project is called Despacho Covarrubias. The university holds the archive of the uh, artist and anthropologist Miguel Covarrubias. And we played around with the drawings that, that he had made. Uh, Covarrubias was first a cartoonist who worked for some magazines in the US, Vanity Fair and the New York Times. And then he turned into an anthropologist and there was an interesting transition in his turn from drawing cartoons into drawing to get to know other cultures. So we digitized a bunch of his drawings and showed it in the uh, exhibition space at Capilla del Arte in downtown Puebla and animated some of these drawings and presented it in several ways. This is also, there you go, you have motion. Uh, we worked with uh, theater students to portray uh, an office. So we kind of used something from Covarrubias approach between cartoon and anthropology to basically look at ourselves uh, as users of office space, but kind of looked at anthropologically all this office space was inscribed between a video wall and a mylar wall that would reflect what's happening on the um, video mapping screen on the other side. Uh, we had a pretty nice audio system, so when we get the chance to work with the theater students there, it was really fun. Uh, we had no script. Uh, it was very uh, multidisciplinary, kind of free-flowing experience with um, theater students, architecture students, uh, interior design students. And also the idea was to challenge the use convention of uh, an exhibition space so that the visitor could uh, manipulate objects found there. So when the exhibition ended, uh, it was a beautiful mess. And since then, I've been kind of going back into the telecommunication subject that I mentioned before. I'm obsessed with how antennas are often camouflaged. And uh, more recently, I came up with the research done by the German physicist Ernst Klatny from the early 19th century and ways of visualizing sound. So, for example, on the top, we have the radioelectric spectrum, which is uh, framed by the, the frequencies you can hear and the frequencies you can see. And over there somewhere, you, you find the bandwidth of Wi-Fi. And what Klatnik's experiments in cymatics do is kind of put a bow in a plate. And depending on the frequency, it would show some of these patterns. So I was. I am interested in exploring how this um, physics experiment might be um, represented architecturally. So I was invited to make a, an animated sculpture in the campus. And I'm beginning to work on, on the project. And the idea is basically to make a sort of sand pool in this circular plaza, place some of these plates on which you can put this sand in and make it show some of these patterns. Uh, I'm wondering if you could show something beyond the range of audible frequency, but we'll see about that. Uh, and that's what I'm up to right now. So thank you. Thank you, Eric. Hi, everyone. My name is Lane Katrib, and I received my BRC in 2014. So my work is concerned with uh, the built environment and material culture of marginalized communities. I'm driven by understanding what histories and communities are excluded from scholarship and the built environment, but also how and why these forms of exclusion happen in the first place. So the summer after graduating, I received a travel grant from USC to spend a month documenting poor countryside developments throughout China. 
the developments were part of a government mandate to relocate residents from congested urban centers to these relatively isolated areas. The common thread between the developments is that they were previously occupied by agricultural villages that were completely erased and replaced with simulations of European and North American landscapes. The simulations range in scale from entire master plans to building and landmark facsimiles and even building signage. All the while there was no material trace um, of the communities that existed prior. So during my visit, I typically spent about 12 hours every day to document the extent of these simulations. And I connected with local translators who joined me for a few days in each location to help me interview the few locals who I found, uh, as well as urban planners who worked on the developments. And the common thread is that, or the common narrative rather, is that most were aged out and priced out of living in urban centers and were forced to migrate here. So I, I wrote about the research in an essay um, that explores the theoretical and consumerist underpinnings um, of the countryside developments, along with visual documentation that traces the various scales of Western citations employed with liberal license. Um, I also gathered the various interviews I conducted into a short documentary. Um, and for me personally, it was a good exercise in understanding how engaging community and personally reaching out to people and um, um, getting information beyond what you see on um, the news can be a part of the design process and a part of, part of the, the research process as well. Um, so a couple of years later, I focused on a different form of uh, forced migration. Um, and this was during my time in graduate school at Princeton. Thanks to a studio and a travel grant through Princeton, I visited the Zatari refugee camp in Jordan to document an informal economy that was initiated by Syrian refugees um, is inside the camp. And I went there in response to a proposal by Oxford economists to transport refugees back and forth between the camp and a nearby special economic zone where they could work. But historically, special economic zones have been breeding grounds for human rights issues against migrants. Um, so when I visited the camp, I was surprised to find an incredible array of small businesses that Syrians opened inside makeshift spaces. So the video that you see in front of you is of the Champs-Élysées, the street of uh, commercial spaces that they refer to. Um, and I found out that these businesses were extensions of vocations many of them used to practice in Syria. And to recreate them here, they resorted to stitching caravans and altering the facade to fit the program. And so this self-initiated economy reflected a high degree of cultural resilience. And so rather than transporting refugees to a special economic zone where they could potentially be exploited, um, I chose to focus on how the camp can be improved by observing the culture specific practices of its inhabitants and amending the planning and architecture of the camp accordingly. And to do so, um, I simultaneously worked at the scale of the master plan and at the scale of the caravan module. And during the design process, I met with representatives at the UN Refugee Agency to identify vacancies at the perimeter of the camp where an intervention can take place. And I traced septic tank locations and stormwater flow patterns to determine program distributions. And I created an outline for the program and material specifications to retrofit the caravan module for different programs, which include a greenhouse, a produce market, a slaughterhouse, a fabrication lab in collaboration with a local startup. Um, and these specifications very much take cues from spatial gymnastics that Syrians were already performing at the camp. So the intent is really to amplify existing practices and for this to be led and assembled by refugees. Um, I put together a business plan, which included the design proposal, um, an estimated budget for a pilot program and potential partnerships with locally based organizations and startups that I met with during my visits. Um, I presented the business plan to representatives at government agencies in Jordan and amended the proposal to respond in, in response to security and bureaucratic issues um, they raised. Uh, also, during my, my visit to the camp, I met with a group of refugees who built clay models of historic sites in Syria that were recently destroyed by terrorists. Um, there was a sense of urgency to recreate what was lost. And so in this final project, I traced the history of destructions in historic sites um, from 19th century colonial excavations to more recent violent attacks all of which led to not only the production of debris, but more importantly, the subsequent erasure of debris and the communities and histories it embodied. So I explore this history in an essay that situates debris and the material afterlife of destruction as a productive entry point into uncovering strategic biases against certain communities and histories. And I reached out to scholars from various disciplines, namely anthropology and conservation, 
to understand how they archived this materiality and what knowledge was gained from preserving and repurposing rather than discarding debris. And through these conversations, I began to understand the social and cultural implications of these erasures. So I explored these, these questions in a speculative design project for an archive that collects the debris of historic sites that would otherwise be discarded. The entropic nature of marginalized and the marginalized status of this inventory raises questions of agency, access, mobility, and location, where archives have, have historically been places of order, um, experts, fixed location, and knowledge extraction. An archive for debris upsets these standards to become a space for experts and non-experts, um, a space of, of knowledge extraction and knowledge production, um, a space that is neither state nor privately owned. Um, a space that is stateless, and a space where its inventory is touched, examined, rearranged, demolished, uh, reconstructed, and destroyed again in a constellation of cycles that produces as much as it records historical knowledge to produce an index of uh, shifting cultural changes. So the project was part of a gallery exhibition in New York, um, and it included the design proposal, a book of essays exploring the historical and theoretical implications of debris, archives, and collecting, um, and it included audio recordings of interviews I conducted with scholars from various disciplines um, who were tackling debris of their own kind. Um, and to, uh, to conclude, my time at USC really shaped the research that I continue to pursue today with a keen interest in engaging various disciplines in not only the research process, but also the design process. Thank you so much for listening. Okay, uh, thank you, Lin. And uh, so I'm Yuan. <clears throat> uh, I'm a graduate from uh, 2015 BIARC, and uh, we also have Ziwei and Yuzhe. Hi, I'm Ziwei. I'm also um, Scarly. I'm also graduating from USC, um, same time with Yuan in 2015. So, yeah, we'll continue. Yeah, and uh, uh, me, Scarlett, Yuzhe, and uh, Fei, we found uh, our ZZYY studio in Shanghai last year. And uh, uh, and this is our first project that it's a Qingyun Street Bar. We finished January this year. And it's also a Luo Sifen restaurant, which is kind of a noodle. It's about 200 square meter. And we want to bring the flowing space from interior to the outside and bring the public to the inside. Like the client is Fen Jia, a very famous uh, Luo Sifen brand in Shanghai for 10 years. Their order restaurant is always full of people and they want to get a new uh, uh, restaurant. And we use the smell of the Luo Sifen noodle as a concept and materialize the abstract smell to the flow of space. The, the site is in a refurbished uh, building for co-working space. And the restaurant has one side facing the street and one side in the building. And the street is a popular space famous for Instagrammable stores, bars, and restaurants. There are a lot of, always a lot of people. And the concept is drifting smell and uh, uh, flowing space. We want the space flow from inside to the street, creating more formal dining experience in the inner part and the more casual experience near the street. And the furniture extends to the outside. Uh, we want the space to be fluid and comfortable. We choose wood and concrete to create the bazaar atmosphere of Liu Zhou city, which is the, uh, the wall show. The wall is made of uh, perforated aluminum panel and, and in the morning and the late afternoon, the sunlight will cast into the restaurant and uh, it's very enjoyable to have some drinks and desserts there. A lot of people passing by will be attracted by the wall and look into the uh, flowing furniture. And we want the, and the other side has longer parts facing the street. People like to sit there, look at the street, having some drinks and uh, food. And in warm days, people can also sit outside and look inside. We use two materials on the ground, the light terrazzo and the dark stone. 
And uh, in our imagination, the space is comfortable and fluid. People can walk around freely and the space shows fluidity. And the users spend a lot of time and effort on the site and enable the detail, the material comes in, comes to what I want. But the, it's funny how the reality turns out. There are always a lot of people and the waiting lines and the, the space seems stops flowing and uh, the clients decorates the interior with a lot of different flowers and pot plants and they build the Babel Tower with their uh, product box and uh, the way. Yeah, so back from the reality, um, we want to also share another competition project we recently did. Uh, it was an international library competition in Songdo, New Town, which is a city near the capital of South Korea. So the topic was interesting to us as it asked us to think about what the new typology of library could be, especially in this age of digitalization and fast media. And what we want to do is we want to create a very unique and drastic experience by floating this library program um, high above on the forest. So in this way, it can present as a platform, a public platform of culture and knowledge. And more importantly, we think in this way, it will free up the ground floor um, and provide the forest back to the city. So where citizens from Songdu can come to play and meander through in this park and find their way gently up um, to the hills of the library. So here, it's, it, it will establish a more poetic relationship um, with the landscape and with the golf course in the distance as well as the sea. Um, in this library, what we want to do is create a gentle balance between this bold and poetic relationship. And so internally and conceptually, this prototype was also constructed from a series of um, connected terraces that spring up from ground floor to the top floor. And the bottom part was the digital reading space where the top part was a more traditional uh, archive and reading zones as well as activity space. So this is our favorite views um, as it tells us a clear relationship between this library and the forest below. Um, and then the central, um, Lobby Hall was also a, a very symbolic gesture of leading people up through this knowledge of um, climbing up through knowledge. Um, so in, within this digital reading space, it, it, surrounded by the forest, we use this series of architecture service for LED screens, as well as technology appliances. Together, they create a very refreshing and new futuristic look uh, reading zones. Whereas this upper um, floors and reading space, we want to use wooden warm colors to create a more uh, welcoming and natural, natural look space that will connect people better to the nature um, surrounded by this forest. Um, so here it, 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 dr it dramatically differs from this uh, lower digital space and it brings you back to the more primitive reading habits. Um, or physical readings. So um, in, this, in this competition, we, we kind of really express our concept as a very drastic floating box. But in the end, uh, the, the, the winning proposal was the left uh, where it's more like a community scale uh, library. But it's interesting to participate where we see the jury's comment uh, on the right is this a discussion between monumental structure, whereas um, what they want as an easily accessible uh, community library. Yeah. Uh, thank you for listening. Uh, thank you. So um, I'm Camilla Laura Nicole. Uh, I'm a designer and a writer, and I graduated from the MHC program in uh, 2018. What you see here is one of the two projects that I've been working on since then. Um, one of them is this one, it's called the Vernacular Project. The other is Q26, but I'm gonna start here. This here is the heart of the project. It's a map that's gonna be developed by uh, the community, by the black community to um, figure out what the black vernacular looks like, what the black aesthetic in the built environment looks like. And ultimately it'll be a collection of images that will ideally impact placemaking in the, in the real world. Here um, are a couple yeah. of scenes that are also really incremental, are really important to the project. The first one actually was able to win, actually won an award with the A&D Museum this past November. 
and it really uh, defines the background for the project. So um, yeah, this project, I started solidifying it late last year, but um, really it started when I was still a student at USC. When I was in class, I used to draw a lot because it helped me focus and I would essentially draw circulation diagrams. And then at some point I learned about shotgun houses and realized that shotgun houses is really the closest thing to a vernacular architecture style um, that African-Americans have. Uh, and so I started, I continued drawing, but I started drawing based on the shotgun house. I started doing circulation diagrams mm -hmm. and then I started exploring what the shotgun house could have potentially evolved into um, if given the opportunity. The thing is, is that, you know, past, past this, past uh, learning about the history of Black people moving in this country, past uh, the shotgun house, you don't really learn much about um, the Black aesthetic in the built environment. Typically, you just know that Black people moved North, they moved West, and we lived in places that we were allowed to live in. And there wasn't really much chance to really build our communities. So what Vernacular Project does is it, expands on this idea of what would our houses look like, it, it starts looking at what would our communities look like, what would our neighborhoods, our cities look like if we were able to develop them based on our needs, our desires, and our histories. Uh, I ultimately, you know, by fall this year, um, I hope to be able to start really getting people together in the community to put, you know, to put an input on the different towns that you saw on that map. These zines are really kind of like the, the underlying thought process for it. It's how do these different places feel? Um, what do these different places look like? What would I wish they did look like? What, how do I wish they served me and my community? Um, yeah, that's, that's pretty much it for, for these. Oh. Um, this last scene, I focused on texture. There's going to be one more and it's going to focus on color. Uh, with texture, it was like, how does, for instance, how does Beverly Hills feel when I'm in Gelson's? How does uh, Malibu feel when I'm at the beach? Do I feel like I'm welcome there? Sometimes I do, sometimes I don't. How, how does it feel just to walk through the world as a Black person and as a Black queer person? And then the next thing I'm going to talk about is Q26, which also has to do with diversity in the environment, but just in a little bit of a different way. So Q26 is a multimedia nonprofit that supports uh, queer people of color who are creatives with a specific focus on, um, on the people of color part. There's so much opportunity in uh, Los Angeles and in LA County to work in creative fields, but um, a lot of those opportunities tend to not be open to people of color and especially for people of color, despite how much impact we have on media, on the arts. So um, in the future, what we really wanna do is we wanna be able to offer equipment rentals, computer rentals, classes, uh, and opportunities to work on our own projects in-house as well as projects with other companies. Uh, what you're seeing here is uh, a screenshot of one of the films that uh, one person on our team put together. Um, past that, we have created five magazines. Yeah, five, and you'll actually see images of those later on. Uh, we've done a series called The Out Crowd. This is a shot from that, which highlighted queer creatives, fashion designers, filmmakers, uh, musicians in Los Angeles. And we were really gonna expand on that in 2020, but 2020 was uh, not really great for filming for a variety of reasons. So we didn't, we didn't do that. But right now we're excited to say that we have a short film in production right now, as well as two other films um, in pre-production. So we're really excited about that. The best thing about it though, is that um, all, of, all of those projects that we're working on in-house are going to, create opportunities for queer creatives who are just starting on their paths to get involved, work on projects, meet new people, uh, get involved with their communities. Because you know our community is there, but it can be a little spread out and it could be a little hard to find. I found the community through the arts. 
I found it in undergrad when I was there. Uh, I found my community in the arts. When I left undergrad, same thing. I found it by, you know, emailing Stuzo, which is a, um, a, a fashion line. And from there, it kind of built. But I, it shouldn't take years for people to find their team and find people to work with and grow with and build their skills with. It also shouldn't take hundreds of thousands of dollars or at least tens of thousands of dollars to learn and be able to really um, enjoy the opportunities that are in Los Angeles. So we are creating that opportunity. We're creating that community. Um, we're giving folks that chance to be seen by the rest of their community and to, yeah, to really grow within themselves and work with us, work with others. Um, our ultimate, ultimate goal is to be able to offer affordable live work studios for, for creatives. Um, our goal is to really start looking at that in five years. Thank you. Hi, everybody, and welcome to the Poche Party. I'm Toby Ashir, and I graduate, graduated with my Master's of Architecture in 2019. And I'm Morgan Sumner. I graduated with my Master's of Architecture in 2018. We both enjoyed our experience at USC so much. It's actually where our little design love story started. And we're excited to be sharing with you, with you what we've been working on since. So as we mentioned, we're Poche Design Studio. Um, we've juggled a lot of ideas, but we ultimately landed on this word. Most of us will recognize the word Poche being defined as the solid portions of an architectural plan typically shown in shades of black. In short, we aim to occupy and amplify the black space in design. Poche Design Studio launched in March of 2020, starting with products. After we expanded, soon after we expanded, we're taking our client work in May. In that time, we've been blessed to have 37 projects and counting, 90% of our clients have been Black women, and we have been awarded two grants, and that is an amazing feat. So it was all a dream. We graduated to use our architectural skills and training to service the Black community. I wanted a Father's Day card for my younger brother, one that I knew that did not yet exist. So rather than spending time trying to find it on the internet, we decided to start this thing. And so from this card, Poche was born. We are both Black women in the architecture field, so we are super hyper aware of the lack of diverse representation. We recognize the need for work that created and also strengthened new connections. As architects and designers, we understand the importance of enhancing these connections constantly. Poche aims to use different mediums to always express our love for our culture. Ultimately, it all comes from love. Everything we do is out of love. We're advocates for never giving your life. We believe in embracing the parts of yourselves that others might try to hide. Most importantly, we always connect back to our history as often as we can. We honor our ancestors by keeping their stories alive. Through our work, we always wanted to see our faces continuously shown in spaces and also narratives that we are usually excluded from. And also as young professional millennials, we wanted to create art to beautify the spaces we occupy daily and also use the same art to act as a mirror for our lives and the dreams that we have might not have realized yet. So how do we define space if we were to ask an architect or a designer, somebody trained in architecture? It's a map, drawing, space, place. If we would ask a muggle, they might reference people, music, culture, emotions tied to experiences. As designers with feet firmly planted in both worlds, we try to find ways to constantly bridge the gap. So those are the foundations of Poche's. We put our voice out into the world and the world responded. We've been so fortunate enough to work with amazing clients so far, much like author Tamara Winfrey Harris. She's an example of how we used our talents to amplify black voices through design. Her work speaks for itself and we simply aided in telling the visual storytelling element. Images pictured here are her book cover designed by another wonderful black illustrator that inspired our mood board. From there, we created her reader experience kit to accompany her book reads that included a series of body body positive imagery for young girls and grown women alike. The Reader Experience Kit is a way to promote intergenerational conversations, which is something that we really need to be having. The Bold Prize is an initiative planned by another amazing black woman, Sabrina Hersey Issa, who wanted to create an actual award to uplift and honor courageous black women leaders. Often black women navigating painful, toxic work environments feel invisible and isolated. This award is a small gesture to say, we see you, we got us. Our design of the new official logo had to be something that made a statement while also maintaining a feminine edge. Inspired by Jesse Owens, who uses one of the Olympics as a platform to make a poignant statement about Black lives, our logo also does this by paying homage to that moment and acts as a reminder that this is for us and also by us. 
Another glimpse into Black femininity lies within Chanel McFarland's candle company, Femme Noir. As a candle connoisseur, Chanel wanted to create a candle company that was based in Blackness, from the company name to the branding to the individual scents. Her debut collection was actually branded as Curls and Kinks Candle Co., which served its original purpose of getting her company going, but ultimately was not a brand image that she wanted to stay married to. So we promptly divided, provided those divorce papers so that she could run with her new and mature sultry line. Still representative of her original branding goals, each label plays tribute to the Black female body with hand-drawn figures and silhouettes to accompany her new line. We always wanted to have our work show up in the places we don't traditionally exist in. Social Venture Partners International, a nonprofit organization, reached out to us after having the unfortunate experience of working with a large scale corporate agency for their Reimagine Giving campaign. We wanted a refresh start and we were more than happy to step in. We took the original slide deck presentation and injected a whole new life into it. If you're going to ask people to donate money towards a greater good, you have to look even better while you do it. And their new presentation hits their clients with a lot more razzle dazzle to hold their attention and also is way more better than is way better <laughs> than the original presentation did. Like the beginning of every great love story, we slid into the DMs of author Mia and Bird Song in May of 2020 when she made an inquiry looking for designers for marketing the launch of her new book. Since then, we're so happy to say that we've been consistently booked and busy with client work solely off of the word of mouth. And that's freaking amazing. And as much as we love client work, we, we truly do. It's important for us to maintain the independence of creating for people like us. We started with at least 101 different ideas. There's a literal list. Um, and we're probably only on number 11, but that has not stopped us. Our product line is an extension of our personality. This is for the young millennial with us a woman mind. Social media has been so crucial to our business development. If you don't know, it's a full-time job, but it has also been worth it. We were able to share our work with influencer Taylor Colley, where she used our, where she featured our master plan poster in her intention setting workshop with some of her followers. It was so amazing to see our work used tangibly to create and enhance connections. Beyond the master plan, cards, and posters, every item we create is discussed, designed, and detailed by us. We create work that serves us, understanding that while Toby and Morgan are individuals, our stories and experiences can connect with so many others. We're just young, ambitious people trying to make a positive difference in this world. If we can create success while winging it and figuring it out on the go, how much further can we go when we do it with intention? So if you want to join the Poche party, it's always open invite. And you can follow our journey on Instagram at bypoche and www.bypoche.com. Over to our friend, Josh. Thank you, thank you very much, Morgan and Toby. It's great to see you. Um, hey everyone, my name is Josh Foster, um, MR 2019. So currently I'm a designer and job captain at KFA Architecture in LA, um, where I focus on multifamily housing, both on the affordable and market rate side. I'm also an incoming adjunct professor at East LA Community College's architecture program. And I also coach high school football here in Long Beach, which is where I just sped over from as evidence from the bottom half of my shorts that you can't see. Um, but coupling in all those things, what I do, um, working with AIA, SoCal Noma, it's always a mouthful when people are like, Josh, what, what, what do you do? Well, I kind of bring it down to the idea of saying that I'm a community builder. What I really like to do is build communities, not just physically, but also economically and socially. Um, the, there are two specific transferable things that I felt like I learned in architecture school that connects much of what I call community building. Those two things can be looked at and called storytelling is one. So basically the idea of creative ways to share your story, um, creative ways to be able to talk about what you're into, what you're doing and the different things you'd like to do. And the other one being digital design. So di digital design can come in the, the realm of graphics. It can come in the realm of website design, basically all things that's graphic short of printed material. And that's two things that um, I feel like I really was able to hone in when I was in architecture school. It's something that I use now to be able to, to push forward what it is that, that we're doing. So one of the ways that I've been able to combine my knack for storytelling and design is another part of my life that I didn't mention before, but that's the topic of this talk today is Mint Inc. Simply summarized, Mint is a platform that develops and empowers a community of young professionals and entrepreneurs of color. 
So I co-founded Mint Inc. in 2018 alongside a fellow Columbia University alum of mine, Sharon Pearson, who has a background in tech education and digital marketing. Our team is made up of two other fellow Columbia alum from Barnard College of Columbia University, our editor-in-chief and mentorship director. And of course, last but not least, had to throw in a USC Trojan, Austin, um, who's a building science alum. And so, as you can see, the core team kind of kept it in the family of both the schools that I was able to attend. And so, Mint, the three pillars of the programs that we really focus on is collaboration, community, and connectivity. Through that, we encourage the next generation of leaders, creators, and change makers to be able to reach their maximum potential and all of what they do. So our foundational output and the very first public offering was and is Mint Mag, which is a digital magazine highlighting and sharing the stories of professionals and entrepreneurs of colors. The articles can be viewed as a flip book or as a web article. One of the unique things about this is that it's all been done in-house. So from the web design, from the magazine layout, from even photography and videography for the magazine for some of our most recent issues, which we have 12 of right now, um, has all been done by our, our team in-house and all has been done with collaboration from different co connections that we have. A lot goes behind the scenes in each issue um, from scheduling with the cover features to me sliding in people's DMs on Instagram and asking if they want to be a part of this. Um, from features and writers um, and exceptional editing done by our editor in chief. And so we've been able to work with a lot of amazing people, not just in the LA area, but also New York, um, in Minnesota, in Atlanta. And basically we connect with people in these cities, even if we can't physically be there to be able to do the photo shoots and different things like that. The coolest thing about all of this has been the number of awesome individuals that we've had a pleasure of working with. Um, as you can see, we've worked with about 150 different people um, and we've been able to share their stories through our, throughout 185 countries, had thousands of viewers, um, but at the end of the day, it's all one community. And that's been the biggest thing that we're very proud of. So another program that I wanna highlight is the Empowerment Conference. So last year in the midst of the pandemic, we had a bright idea to launch our very first conference. Everything we do is digital and tech related. So this would be a breeze is basically what we said. That's not what happened. We realized that it was a very heavy weight to lift, lift and pull, but we made it happen in the end and we we're able to produce a conference with over 150 registrants um, and featured pre-recorded panels, networking sessions, live workshops, a musical performance from a friend and music artist out in Singapore and an award ceremony over the course of a few days. We're excited to see how we can expand and make this better, but it was really unique to use what was a a Zoom heavy year to be able to connect people from all across the world that has their own stories of being people of color in their own places. And so that was something that we were really proud of um, being able to put on and something that we looked to, to catapult into some of the other programs that we're doing. And so as you can see here, there we, we had two specific award recipients. Um, we had the Empowerment Creative Impact Award um, which is by my friend Subhash, who's out in Singapore, and we had the Empowerment Achievement Award, um, which is from co-founder and CEO of Blavity. So being able to bring these people together and just share their stories and do interviews was really, really important. And so last but not least, I want to highlight the brainchild of our mentorship director, Alejandra. Long story short, she came to me with an idea to create a program for young entrepreneurs of color where they could be mentored and matched with seasoned entrepreneurs. It was a no-brainer for us. It fit in line with our mission and all she needed was a place to house it and a team that was willing to help her develop it into what it is. And I feel like that's what we do best at Mint, be able to create that platform. We're halfway through our inaugural cohort program. Um, two mentees in the program um, just presented before me, Morgan and Toby, and really excited and happy that they were able to be a part of this inaugural program and hope that they got a lot out of it. Um, there's definitely been bumps in the road with launching a program like this with no experience of doing so from scratch, but with awesome partnerships with the RISE um, Consulting Group out of the New York City and the nonprofit Junior Achievement, we've been able to make it work in what hopes to wrap up as a meaningful experience for this first cohort. As with all programs and even Mint itself, basically we just found a need, jumped right into solving it. And any of my friends can tell you that I've always been the just just do it guy 
if they come to me with a question on whether they should do an idea or whether something is good for them to take a dive into, my response is always the same. It's just do it. And that's how we run into that mint. We dive in, we learn while doing, we create an impact and we build communities. So thank you all for taking the time to listen and please follow us on Instagram and check out our website. Fight on. All right. Well, Josh, thanks so much for that. Um, and everybody else, th that was amazing. Like uh, some really, really incredible presentations. I think uh, something that we wanted, if, yeah, if all the speakers can turn on your cameras and, um, you know, just wanted to um, say thank you all for an amazing set of presentations. Uh, it, it's been a real pleasure. I think a, a lot of you have known for a very long time and have been able to see from, you know, uh, your early stages of, of your architectural careers now move on to bigger and better things. Um, I think this event is something that we've, you know, we started back in 2017. Uh, Aaron, as you mentioned before, was uh, one of the first participants. I believe uh, Myrna was in the second group, right, in 2018. Um, and uh, shortly after, both of them joined the faculty. And I think it really is something that we're really proud of in terms of being able to highlight how our alumni have gone on to have independent careers not only go on to have architectural careers that are uh, in the employment of others, but to actually leverage their design abilities, whether it's for architecture or art or graphic design or manufacturing or anything else. And it's, it's a real pleasure to see, I think, as a faculty member, uh, it's been around for a bit now, it's actually one of the biggest pleasures we can have as faculty is seeing the success of our students after they leave the program and still being able to retain contact with them. So with that said, uh, I would like to uh, open it up to uh, questions. Um, I think, uh, well, actually we just had one pop up right now from uh, Annabelle Asali. Uh, how many years of experience do you guys feel was necessary before you felt comfortable in starting up on your own in whatever it was that you did? I'm gonna pick on you on this. Uh, <coughs> so I, I feel like in China because the economic is is not bad. <laughs> there are a lot of opportunities, and we are based in Shanghai, so it's always there are many interior projects that we can do. And uh, so after we come out of our original firm, we think. We are pretty optimistic, and uh, <laughs> and uh, uh, actually, we also we get projects very quickly after we uh, get together, and uh, so I feel it's kind of lucky. And uh, China, welcome to China. <laughs> I mean, maybe for to expand on that question for all of you is, is not just how long it took you to feel like it was necessary, but what made it feel, what made you feel like it was necessary to actually do something on your own outside of uh, working for someone else? I, I'll just jump in there. Um, I, I think it's less about the amount of experience and more about um, having work. <laughs> so that at the point at which you have enough work to support yourself, I think that's that's the time to strike out on your own. And I think if you're motivated, um, you'll figure it out and you can surround yourself with people who are um, skilled and who can help you when um, when you come across something that you just don't know the answer to. Um, and uh, yeah, I, I would be less you know, I, I started, a, a, you know, I did my first project three years out of school um, and I didn't have a license. I had very limited experience, but, um, you know, I worked with a great contractor and I learned a lot <laughs> and made a few mistakes um, and uh, it went from there. Just piggybacking off of what, what Chad said, I, I think it is really important to surround yourself with, with people that you feel like can support you in whatever you're doing, um, whatever stage of that experience that you're in, and being able to reach back in that network and have that, I think, is what's really important. Um, 
just like I said in my presentation, I always tell people just just do it. You you have your experience, you have your own own knowledge base that you can bring to something, no matter how how long out of school you are. There's something unique that you can bring to a project or whatever you're doing, and so surround yourself with people that can help amplify the skill sets that you're not strong in yet, and then just make it happen. Well, Josh, with you, it's more like, what are you not doing? I, I, you've got so many things going on. Sleep, but I learned that from our architecture school, so that's <laughs> what I'm not doing. Um, to kind of also build off of what Chet was saying, like, I think I, I kind of felt like this might just be my own personal experience, but um, I was always waiting for, I always wanted to start my own practice and I was always waiting for a point where I felt like I was ready. Um, and I don't, I don't think that point ever came. Like, I, I think with every project you're always learning, even with every individual project that I was working on, like in a firm, you were always learning so many new things. Like every project is different and it's the same with starting like your own practice I think like um I think especially in regards to starting like a product also um but it, I think it's the same with the with the practice like you're always going to be learning so many new skills like on the go so I, I don't if you're waiting for that moment where you're you feel like you're ready to like make that jump I don't know if that moment like ever came. And I think just do it if it's something you want. So for us, we, we had a lot of conversations on, it would be cool if you did this and it would be really great if you did this. And there was a lot of just ideas passing back and forth between us. Um, and one day we were just like, okay, if we actually want to do this, we really had to change our mindset from part-time hobby to part-time job to full-time job. and kind of making that transition from this is just something that we're daydreaming about to something that we're doing it. And we literally figure out, I mean, we're, we're not doing architecture, but there's so many things that we're figuring out on the go. Like <laughs> somebody will ask us a question, we will Google it, YouTube it and figure it out as that day and then provide an answer that day. So that's that's something for us that we, we realized in starting Poche. And also um, going off what Morgan said, we had a meeting on the first day of January of 2020 and we just like locked in and we're like, these are our goals. This is what we're trying to do. Let's see what happens. And then I was, I always say this now, like I was blessed to lose my job at a firm and be forced into like actually turning the car on and going with it. And what really like put the battery in our back is the confidence that our clients have had in us and the confidence, the reaction of people to what we do, where it's us, we're like, oh, y'all, y'all like this? Are you gonna pay, pay us to do this? Oh, okay, okay. And so you start to build that confidence, like as more people trust you and like like what we do, like, yeah. So it's 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 kind of just trusting in yourself, and it's good to have you know someone to when you feel low to pull you up and vice versa. Yeah, piggybacking off of that, I guess everyone's piggybacking off of everyone. <laughs> But uh, yeah, same thing, like with, um, especially with Q26, it has been just, I keep calling it just stumbling forward, like just kind of learning constantly, constantly, constantly. Um, and with it being like a nonprofit, it's been, yeah, like learning how to form a nonprofit. Like you don't just, unless you go to, you know, I don't know, business school or nonprofit school, I don't know. Um, you know, you don't really just learn and know how to do it. You just kind of have to start and start doing the research and then start trying. Um, and that's what a, the last few years has been trying and moving and growing every, every day, really. Um, question for all, all of you. Um, I guess this is like a, a, something that's been put together for multiple questions that all kind of touch on the same topic, but, uh, what would you guys say has been a specific experience or course at USC that's helped you or uh, helped you develop your inspiration? Or what would you say is the biggest lesson you learned from architecture school? I'd like to answer that one. 
uh, because the, the first project I show, in fact, came out of my thesis project, which was working close with uh, ideas from uh, my Marco Sanchez. So in my case, I was working with him as a professor. And uh, I, I found uh, at this US, USC experience an opportunity to actually uh, engage in research ideas, which were hard to frame within architecture, but I found a way to do it and to sell the idea to get a project funded. So the, the biggest lesson would be kind of that finding a way to actually use the experience of being enrolled in a program uh, of studies and try to make it fit your interests somehow. Um, if I could also briefly respond to that. Um, I So I did a BS uh, in architecture at USC, which I don't know what it's like now, but at that time was sort of unusual uh, because I had started in the five-year program. And then about around my second year, I started having doubts about whether I was interested in architecture. Um, and I actually think what was so incredible about the school was one, I had an amazing uh, mentor in Anna Neymark, who is no longer, I think, at USC, but uh, she really encouraged me to pursue my interests, whatever they actually were, right? And uh, the school having the flexibility to sort of uh, help me navigate the what that means in sort of like getting all your credits and units to graduate on time. Uh, I actually think that was a really amazing way that USC supported uh, sort of my growth and development was like helping me to curate my own sort of interest and like uh, and so what I ended up doing is I took two years of studio and then I took a year completely away from studio uh, and took uh, courses in philosophy and anthropology and like all these other amazing resources that USC has and took advantage of those and in the end I was like I, I think I still want to be an architect but I now have this kind of like breadth of uh, budding knowledge, let's say, that I can bring back now into my design work. And so I think that the school was able to support me in that was really, really wonderful. And, um, and I think that also paved the way for the kind of interdisciplinary work that I'm really interested in. I'd like to just piggyback off of what Regina's saying also. I, I think that one of the um, most lasting things that that I got from architecture school and what I didn't fully appreciate at the time is just the the access to a studio instructor um, and sort of having the opportunity to in a way I mean I think studio instructors are doing this at the same time they're kind of reaching inside of our minds and kind of bringing the best out of us um, but also the opportunity as a student to see how someone else views uh, a design problem. And, and I mean, also your, your colleagues who are in your studio with you. Um, I think that's sort of something that you don't get much as a working professional. I mean, you're working amongst colleagues, you have uh, maybe someone who's leading the firm um, or you're working on a team, uh, but the, the parameters seem so much more set, that it's so much more rigid. Um, and particularly now that I am, I have uh, my own studio and I, I'm working with other people in the office. I mean, those personal connections and, and hearing about somebody else's idea about how they might do something is, is so powerful to me. And I um, feel like I learned so much just from the people that I work with from day to day. And, um, and if I could go back in time, I, I might have listened more to the people who are around me um uh and and really soak up as much as I could from from everyone I was around. Any others want to share their experiences? I'll answer. Um, I think a really formative experience for for me from the architecture school was the Asia and Urbanism Study Abroad program. Um, it was curated by Andrew Liang and some others. And I remember right when we got there, I kept 
you know, Andrew would go on these like tangents and he said this one thing that like has resonated with me forever. He said, look for the differences in things. And, um, you know, as a girl sort of born and raised in Los Angeles, the biggest sprawl ever. And then going to somewhere like Hong Kong that was truly vertical was, it was just like mind bending. Um, so I really love that program. I can also follow up. Um, I think um, something that was really integral during my time at USC was uh, the, um, the travel fellowships that USC offered uh, through the School of Architecture. Um, and I, um, I did a couple of those and it really kind of uh, gave me the time and space to explore um, what my interest was. And um, I remember the summer after my fourth year, um, I um, focused on um, understanding how um, immigrants lived in the suburbs of Paris and documenting the spaces in which they lived. And the summer after that, I got to experience, uh, as, you see, as you saw in the project and the presentation, um, how migrants lived in the countrysides um, in China. And it was really through these experiences that I sort of, uh, I really kind of um, developed and continue to develop an interest in understanding how, um, how the kind of the built environments of marginalized communities um, are both a vehicle for, or I guess are both kind of the reason why they are marginalized, but, but also sort of the hidden biases um, in which the, um, um, in, in which those uh, forms of exclusion happen. Um, and it, if it wasn't for, for those opportunities through USC, I probably would have gone in a completely different direction. Um, and so I really am grateful um, for those opportunities and, and the ability to have the time and space to, to explore them and, um, and carry them through in a kind of independent effort. All right, another set of questions for all of you. Who wants to talk about what your biggest mistake or your biggest triumph was? Might be a touchy one, but. So we can, we can jump on. I think for uh, us, one of our biggest mistakes is actually undervaluing our work and its impact. We, we were sending out invoices to clients and they're like, are you sure it only costs this much? And we're like, are you doing something wrong? Like, we were gosh. doing something wrong. We were undercharging. <laughs> so, um, we were like, oh, okay. I mean, if you want to pay more. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> we really undervalued kind of what our impact was. And so I think that that's probably been the biggest lesson and something that we're still learning mm -hmm. is how to give value to something that is you know a creation of our mind so that's that's probably our biggest mistake triumph um i think our biggest triumph is our work like our work speaks for itself and our it speaks for itself and it's it's our story like when we have moments with like uh, when we have moments with clients and sometimes I'm like, oh my God, we're, we're working, walking in our purpose. Like, this is what we want, said we wanted to do. And we're actually doing it. Like having clients, like I said, we, we haven't had to market our client work. We only market our products because, you know, that's us. But even with that, when we have repeat cost customers, we have repeat clients, we're on retainer with organizations. And it's like, all we did was make you this cool thing and you just keep coming back for more. So it's an amazing feeling. I think that's our biggest triumph. Like our work really does speak for itself and you know, we're proud of it. And we're only beginning. This is only just the beginning. So, so you know. <laughs> uh, yeah, I want to talk about like, uh, I think my biggest mistake in undergrad is to, is like, is uh, pushing too much to apply to graduate school. <laughs> <laughs> like I we mean, know like in 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 my fourth year uh to fifth year and uh, the applying process is very uh, busy and uh, pressure and uh, but uh, I, I think at but at that time that like uh, uh the school the studio is also very busy it's, it's kind of hard to balance the applying process and the, the uh, studio project and other things and uh, it turns out that uh, uh, and and the result is like I was rejected by all the American schools <laughs> and have finally have to go to AA but uh, uh, but it's also but 
it turns out it turns out to be a good thing finally. Like <laughs> it, it's a mistake, but uh, I think going to A is also a the right choice. It's really a different architecture world. Uh, but uh, I think it, it's good not to push too much in undergrad and uh, should focus more on like uh, uh, pro like studio or life uh, and just uh, getting more interesting in different aspects and uh, give some buffer time and think about it really think about what to do after. Uh, All right. Does anybody have any closing remarks before we uh, open up the the mixing room? There, there is a there is a, a social space that uh, uh, Cynthia Pena from the um, events would like to share with us. But before we go, is there any last words you guys would like to to share with the students? Okay. So uh, maybe Cynthia, would you like to? Uh, share with everybody the details on how to access the uh yeah room. hi everyone i just added or i'm adding to the chat right now um there was an email that went out earlier this morning with instructions on how to get on to sophia but if you didn't see it i'm adding it right here um just go ahead and copy that url i'm going to put it in a separate chat as well so it doesn't get lost um and you can sign up it's like two steps with your email it's super simple um and the platform is kind of you chat through proximity. So um, you can move your little icon closer and away from people to engage in conversations. So if you have any questions, you can find my icon. I'm gonna be on the first level. It says, need help, ask me. And I will help you navigate any questions about the program. Right. But I hope you join us. And so we'll be able to go in there and you guys can uh, join us in that, that space and mix and mingle with the presenters, ask them questions. Uh, uh, get to know each other and have a chance to chat amongst yourselves. So I will see you guys all in the Sophia space. Thanks, everyone. Thank you. Thanks, guys.